Hello, good morning. Uh, this is your first lecture. Normally we would be doing this in person, but due to circumstances, uh, myself and a couple other people have been quarantined at home. Um, I am safe, I am healthy, uh, but still can't come to school for a couple more days. So our first lecture is going to be this video lecture along with the PowerPoint that I posted in Blackboard. So. Um, we're going to talk about prehistory today, and this is just the period before historical records are written down. And it's important to know that a lot of this early history is what we would call speculative, meaning we don't know 100% for sure. It's putting together history, it's putting together biology, and it's putting together um, anthropology. So. Yeah, this is just the best information that we have right now in 2020. Uh, there are some assumptions that are made. There are some discoveries that have been made recently. And uh, what we think is that our earliest ancestors appeared in Eastern and Southern Africa about 4 million years ago. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, lineage, pretty good timeline. We found lots of fossils from that time and biologists, historians, and anthropologists have all worked together to say this is probably what happened. Uh, these ancestors, they stayed in Africa for about one and a half million years. And the biggest limiting factor, the reason they didn't move very much, is quite simply um, climate. Uh, early humans were limited. They couldn't go where it was too cold. They couldn't go where it was too hot. So they were uh, in these grasslands, these savannas of eastern and southern Africa for about you know, three and a half million years. Uh, fire is really what changes that. Fire is a very important discovery. It's like this turning point. Um, and there's two reasons for it. Number one, it increased the food supply. Uh, it, would, it allowed these early hominids to cook um, seeds, cook roots, cook meat that, um, while somewhat edible in its raw form, was much more uh, healthy, had a larger caloric value after it was cooked. It also provided heat, which meant that these earliest humans could go places that the ancestors couldn't because they could keep themselves warm. And then last but not least, it's also going to uh, provide protection from wild animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Homo sapiens are our direct ancestors. Um, they're first appearing in the fossil record around 100,000 years ago, and we find early Homo sapiens until about 40,000 years ago. And <clears throat> they lived in what was called the Paleolithic Age. Now, Paleolithic, it sounds like a fancy word, and it is. It's a word that um, historians and geologists are going to use. But in reality, Paleolithic just means Old Stone Age. Paleo means old, lithic means stone. Now these early Homo sapiens, uh, they were more intelligent than their ancestors. Uh, they started to spread throughout the world and they existed on hunting and gathering food. Now, the amount of food that could be gathered limited the size of the group, and most of these early groups are about 20 to 50 people. And they're going to be families. Uh, usually it's going to be descendants that are all living together, people who are directly related who are together. Uh, you got the nuclear family, which is mom, dad, children. But then you have extended family, which are grandparents and grandchildren and everything else. <clears throat> now food gathering, it's a job for everybody. The relations between the sexes at the time were, were fairly equal and that's because both men and women were equally important to the survival of the group. Now the men are going to hunt the larger animals and they're going to provide the protein through meat. Women are going to provide uh, most of the everyday food like roots, berries, seeds, fruits, insects, lizards, snakes, rodents, you name it. Now the meat and the fur that the men bring is highly prized. Uh, it's got a high caloric value, a high protein value. 
the women are going to provide the main part of the diet and the women are going to be the ones raising the children. Now you also have this idea of kinship. Uh, kinship groups are going to be really important. Um, and we still have kinship groups today. Your group of friends, that's a kinship group. Your family, that's a kinship group. So kinship, you don't always have to be related. Uh, but at this time, more often than not, you were. Now, kinship is important because it allows everybody to contribute and everybody knows their role in society. Uh, kinship, it determines the duties of the group, uh, your rights, your privileges, the relationship you have with other members in that group. Um, everybody contributed knowledge, whether it was raising kids, providing food, providing shelter, defending against enemies, and you could have human enemies or animal enemies. Now these ties, both comforting, both restrictive. Uh, for example, you know, when you are with your select group of friends, you're comfortable, you know, you know who does what in that group, you kind of have an established role, but if you end up in a new group of people, you can feel a little bit uh, out of place. Uh, if any of you have ever been the new kid at school, you know exactly what, what I'm talking about. Uh, at the same time, you know, it can be restrictive. Maybe you still live with your parents and you are 18 or older and your parents have certain rules that you have to follow and you say, why do I have to do this? I don't want to do this. I'm 18. So kinships are both good and bad. Uh, kinships, they provide security um, and they also provide, like I said, some knowledge. Uh, these hunter-gatherers, they had this extraordinary knowledge of plant life, animal life. They could identify species of plants that would provide them food, provide them medicine. Uh, they knew what they could use for dyes. Uh, they also knew what foods were or what plants were toxic. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that if I were to go out in the woods and be stuck there, I wouldn't know what I could eat and what I couldn't, but these people did. Um, the kinship group's also going to give your rules. It's going to set up your basic beliefs. And just kind of a an interesting thing. Uh, estimates are that these kinship groups, these hunter-gathering groups, they had to clear a one square mile of land a day to sustain two adults. So it's a lot of work keeping this group of 20 to 50 people alive. <clears throat> now you also have talked just for a moment about Neanderthals. Um, Neanderthals are the cl most closely related species to Homo, homo sapiens. Uh, Neanderthals, they don't exist today, although uh, their DNA exists in quite a few of us. Uh, Neanderthals, they lived from about 120,000 years ago to 35,000 years ago. That's when they start to disappear from the historical record. And Neanderthals, they lived in these colder climates of Europe and Asia. They were more in, a, in a, ar not archaeological terms, but in anthropological terms, they were more robust. They had bigger bone structure. They had uh, bigger uh, body density. And that was to keep them warm. Uh, they were skilled hunters. They could use tools. They could create stone tools. Uh, they had burial rituals. They honored the dead. They honored the deceased. Um, there are also speculations that they could speak. Uh, tests have shown that they did have the um, bio biological structures to speak. And even though Neanderthals are gone, it's estimated that somewhere around 3% of DNA in non-African people is made up of Neanderthal DNA. And what that tells us is that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, they intermixed. Now, why did Neanderthals die out? We're not 100% sure. We have some guesses. Uh, we think that there was climate change and we think that there was pressure and um, competition from Homo sapiens and Neanderthals could not keep up. Uh, Neanderthals were more limited in their range. Uh, it was easier for them to run out of food. And their diets were not as mixed as what the Homo sapien diets are. 
All right, agriculture. <clears throat> Eventually, these Homo sapiens, they're going to begin growing their own food. Now, hunting and gathering will still be the primary way that a lot of the people live, but they are going to grow their own food to supplement everything. Now, the idea of domesticated foods, domesticated plants, domesticated animals, is a fairly recent invention. That's somewhere around nine to 10,000 years ago is when we find the first evidence of domesticated foods. Now, some people ask, I always get asked this when we're in, in person, so I'll go ahead and put it into this video. Um, why? Why did people not grow food early? Well, there are a couple of reasons, uh, four big reasons that you need to know. The first reason why uh, Homo sapiens start to switch over to agriculture is the availability of wild food declines. Uh, humans are extremely efficient hunters, and there were many species of creatures and many species of plants that people had just eaten into extinction. There's also this increase in plants and animals that could be domesticated. Uh, climate change at the end of the Ice Age uh, it expanded the area of habitats that people could live in. They're finding new types of foods, new grains, uh, new animals. And it turns out that some of these are very easy to grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's also new technologies. Now you may not think of a bowl as a technology, but it, it really is. Or there's mortars and pestles, the little cup with the stick that you can smash things with. That is a technology too. Uh, fire technically is a technology. Pots are technologies. All of those things are developed and created so you can harvest more food, you can store more food, you don't have to eat everything right away in a half years that it's going to spoil or uh, go bad. And then there's this link between the rise of food production and the rise of human population. The more food there is, the more people are born, the more people that are born, the more food you need. So it becomes this vicious cycle like that. Uh, this period of agricultural development is known as the New Stone Age. Um, new Stone age. Neo, new, lithic, still means stone. So agriculture is going to be the beginning of the Neolithic period. Uh, another part of the Neolithic period is the animal domestication. Um, the idea of raising and domesticating animals begins in modern day Iran and modern day Iraq during this exact same time. And we're pretty sure that the first animals that were domesticated were sheep maybe goats, and then pigs after that. By the time we get to 6000 BC, you pretty much have agricultural developments and animal domestication all through Western Asia, which is eventually going to become known as Mesopotamia, just not quite yet. Now, the next thing that happens is villages. Villages are going to develop uh, somewhere between 6,500 BC and 3,500 BC. And this is going to happen when those hunting gathering groups start to settle down. They realize that if they stay in one place, they can protect their food source while still going out and hunting and gathering. So you would have maybe a large field of wild wheat and these settlers would settle down and they would protect it and they would nourish it and grow it and eventually the wild wheat becomes domesticated wheat. So villages are directly related to the birth of agriculture. And one of the biggest changes in life when you get this idea of villages is the emergence of craftspeople or artisans. Uh, the easiest way I can describe an artisan, it's somebody who makes something, somebody who makes stuff. Now that stuff could be pottery, uh, that stuff could be clothing, it could be tools, it could be weapons, but they're craftsmen, they're making something. 
And one of the things that is most important for these villages is the idea of food storage. So when humans settle, they begin to make pots, which can be used for food storage. It can be used for hauling water and storing water. Uh, for the first time, people can keep water in their homes. And for people of this time, being able to store water in the home was as important as indoor plumbing to us today. <clears throat> now, the woven baskets for food, it allowed clothes to be, or not clothes, but it allowed uh, food to be transported a long way. Uh, you've got cloth being woven from plant fibers that becomes clothing. Clothing protects you from the weather. It keeps you hot. It keeps you cool. Uh, the people making the tools um, they figure out that certain stones can be made into sharp cutting tools. Uh, certain stones can be made into weapons. And you are using rocks originally to do this, but somewhere around 5000 BC we get this change and we, we find that copper is being used to make tools and weapons containers for the first time. Now we don't know exactly how copper is found. Um, our guess, the guess that we were given by anthropologists is probably somebody was baking a pot in, and uh, discovered that this metally ooze came out of certain rocks under heat and then that metally ooze would harden and then they could shape it into whatever they needed. Now if that's really what happened we don't know. Uh, we'll have to get a time machine uh, either you know watch Back to the Future or Bill and Het Bill and Ted, since that's coming out soon, and maybe they can go back in time and tell us. Another development of village life is the idea of trading. Uh, there was already long distance trade uh, by 6,500 BC. We know that because we find things in one area that shouldn't be there. Uh, for example, uh, in Iran and Iraq, they had ways to get something called obsidian which is a rock that's really good for cutting tools and weapons. Uh, the problem is obsidian is not found in Iran or Iraq. It's found in southern Russia, which is over 500 miles away. So that means that these people had some way to get to that supply of obsidian and have it brought back to them. So basically, people are going to realize that you can trade your surplus and you can get stuff for it. So people start trading food. People start trading animals people start trading supplies. Now trading is not the only way you can get things. Village life also means the beginning of warfare. People very quickly realize that I can keep all of my chickens and I can go and take all of your cows by force and then I have all the stuff. There's no reason I need to give you part of my chickens. I can take your stuff and keep my stuff too. So the idea of warfare is going to begin almost as quickly as the idea of trade does. And that's going to lead you to growing excess chickens so you can protect your chicken flock if somebody tries to come and take your chickens. Or it's going to, to lead to you developing extra food storage of whatever you might be having so that way if your neighbor does come and take your things, you still have a food supply that can get you through the lean times. Uh, ironically, warfare is also going to stimulate the development of trade and the development of technology. Uh, war, even today, drives technological change. Uh, people begin to make better weapons. They make them first from copper, and then they make weapons from bronze. And even in the early days of humanity, warfare drives technology. Now these cities, in many cases, they're going to grow up and city life is going to develop. And our first cities are going to develop around 3500 BC and 3200 BC. That's when we find our first evidence of cities. Now unlike villages, these cities are going to house uh, people from a wide variety of occupations. You're still going to have your farmers, because somebody has to grow the food. You're still going to have artisans because somebody still has to make the stuff. And then you're going to get merchants because people are going to sell and trade the stuff. Now the biggest difference between cities and villages though is that you're going to get a 
class of people who become full-time warriors, full-time administrators, and full-time priests. Now, warriors, administrators, and priests, they usually don't produce anything. Uh, they see themselves as protecting the village, but they have to be provided food. So, to put it simply, the top city dwellers, the, the upper class, if you will, they're going to come to rule the society. And you're going to get your first real class division. Now, for these cities, the idea of irrigation is probably the most important thing. Uh, irrigation allows for the rivers to be uh, more or less tamed. It allows these early city dwellers to bring food, or not food, but bring water to them so they can grow their food. And the earliest examples of irrigation are going to happen in what we call Mesopotamia, or the Fertile Crescent. And the early cities are going to grow up between the Tigris River and the Euphrates River, which flows from the... Uh, the Arabian Sea, through Kuwait, through Iran, through Iraq, into Jordan, into Syria. It's going to be that area of the world. And food progression, or food production is going to increase drastically in these areas of irrigation. And as I said already, um, you know, more food means more people, more people means more food. So the population of the Mesopotamian Valley is going to explode. Now, civilization is going to be kind of the, the ultimate form of this early human life. Uh, basically, you know, Homo sapiens are going to go super saiyan, if you will. And uh, the first civilizations are going to begin around 3000 BC in modern day Iraq. And this first civilization has been given the name Sumer. And it was located where the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Arabian Sea all come together. So it was in what would be today Kuwait and southern Iraq. Uh, there were three classes of people. Uh, there were the nobles and the priests. There were the commoners. And there were the slaves. And each of these different groups, they had uh, the... They had uh, different rights. They had different laws and they had different duties. They were not treated the same. Now the different civilizations that pop up, they're going to trade uh, different things with each other. They're going to trade food, wood, stones, metalworking, and the Sumerians are going to become important because they're going to give us a couple of modern day things that we still use today. All right, so one of the things that the Sumerians are going to develop is mathematical notation. The Sumerians, their system is called sexagesimal. It means that it runs on the number 60. And we use this all the time. Uh, there are 60 seconds in a minute. There are 60 minutes in a day. Uh, some of the factors of 60 are 3, 10, and 12. Um, so a foot has 12 inches. A day has two halves of 12 hours, a total of 24 hours. There are 12 months in a year. All of that is part of the Sumerian number system, and a lot of people just don't realize that. Uh, Sumerian math is all over the place, and our world runs on Sumerian math. There's another thing that Sumerians are going to develop, and that's called cuneiform. Cuneiform is the first known writing system, and it allowed the Sumerians to keep records, to write and, and to codify laws, and to transmit knowledge. So originally, cuneiform is going to be like written symbols. It's going to be a pictographic language. But eventually, those simple pictures are going to stand for sounds. And those simple pictures are going to stand for words. So eventually the Sumerian cuneiform is going to become partially alphabetic and partially phonetic. It's not going to be strictly pictures. Now to write, what the Sumerians would do is they would take the end of a reed, meaning like a, a stick, or they would take a piece of bone and they would press in these wedge-shaped marks into wet clay tablets. 
and depending on the shape that is pushed into the clay will tell you what the picture means or what the word means. Another thing that the Sumerians are going to do is religion. Uh, Sumerians are going to create a religion that helps them understand the world around them and helps them to explain nature. So the ancient Sumerians, they do have a mythology. They saw the world having been created by a god. And the gods of Sumeria are established standards by which the people live. So you have different gods who represent different factions of life or different parts of life. Now, one of the main Sumerian deities was named Enlil. It's E-N-L-I-L. -L. And Enlil was primarily a storm god who lived in heaven. Um, Enlil is normally seen as a kind and fatherly god. Uh, Enlil is responsible for making the, the food grow and the ground fertile. And Enlil was credited with designing the plow. But according to Sumerian mythology, um, Enlil was also the one who punished the people on behalf of other gods. So when the people of Sumeria upset their gods, Enlil would stop the rain, or Enlil would cause too much rain and would cause flooding. So the Sumerians, um, besides using math, and besides being able to write all their stories, uh, they came up with this very elaborate mythology that helped them to explain nature. All right, so this is the first video lecture for the year. I don't know how many more video lectures we'll have to do. As of right now, we should be in class next week. If something does change, uh, you will be let know right away. Uh, please also remember, um, if you have any symptoms of COVID-19, if you've been exposed to COVID-19, or if you think you have COVID-19, do not come to class. That's the reason that we are having to do a video lecture right now is some people came to school when they should not have. Uh, so please be careful about that. And um, I, because I need to know that you watch this video, I am going to ask you to put one word into a quiz. Uh, it will show up as a secret word quiz, if you will. And the secret word I want you to write down is healthy. H-E-A-L-T-H-Y. Healthy. I want everybody to stay healthy. The last thing, let me show this real quick. For this week, let's go to lessons. Lessons again, and lesson one. Uh, for this week, what you have to do uh, you have to do this study guide, and what I mean by study guide is just read the textbook, the first 20 pages of the textbook sometime this week, so you have a basic understanding of these words. Um, you'll watch the PowerPoint that I have posted. Um, there will be a couple of online readings for you to do and a video for you to do. You'll have the first quiz. You'll have the discussion and notice I say please answer three of the four you don't have to answer all of them uh, just answer three of them and then your secret word quiz you'll answer right there and that will be available in about 30 minutes from the time I made this video or if you are in tomorrow's class um, it'll be available for you at midnight tonight anyways uh, that is it for today thank you for watching this video to the full uh, 30 minutes and I hope to see all of you next week. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.